you very much. And uh, it is an honor to have you here. I'm just going to bet from meeting some of you uh, that uh, you work with uh, middle school students. Raise your hand if you are representing a middle school or work with middle schools high in the air. So almost all of my research has been in literacy in middle schools. Uh, the curriculum I write is middle school interventions. Uh, I'm working on a project in Michigan uh, uh, on uh, middle schools. I'm working on a project in all of the boroughs of New York City uh, in uh, literacy. Uh, but I bet we also have some high school people here. Raise your hand, high school people. Terrific. Uh, and raise your hand if you work with intermediate students, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. Okay, so my mission, I was asked to talk about uh, telling you everything you need to know about literacy at the intermediate secondary level uh, in uh, an hour and a half, which we only have an hour and 15 minutes. So I had to really uh, think about this. Now you know that uh, you are all going to have access to uh, the PowerPoints. Right, you all know that, right? Some of you may have downloaded them. I gave you a summary of what we're gonna do today uh, so that you would have like a takeaway piece of paper, a little old school. Uh, and um, so what we're going to do is sort of look at two aspects uh, of secondary and intermediate literacy. Uh, one would be uh, what we should do in all of our general ed classes, our science, our social studies, our health class, our English class, uh, all classes, if we want students to have the highest level of literacy. And I'm going to start there before we look at what to do in addition to that uh, for children who are at risk. Uh, because I'm really concerned that maybe we're having a lot of kids more at risk because we're doing less reading uh, than we used to do in classes. Uh, in some classes, uh, the students don't read any science, any social studies, any language arts. And I'm telling you, we got to start there. If we want them to be able to read and write and speak, we better like do it. Uh, so uh, we are going to start with this. Uh, we are going to say answers to partners and we're going to go from this aisle this way, that aisle that way. Uh, for example, you're number one, number two, number one, number two. Uh, but now we have uh, three left. So you're one, you're a two, you're a two. And you're a one and a two. So number off quickly that direction. Uh, people in the back, you still need a partner and there's only two of you, so give your names. Uh, and go that direction. So your partner here? Your partners. No, the two of your partners. You say together in your tree. Okay. Yeah, good idea. Okay. So everybody, again, face your partner. Uh, so I see you. And raise your hand if your number is one. And raise your hand if you're a two. Raise your hand if you're a one. Raise your hand if you're a one. Caught you. Uh, I did. So, but we can start right out with. Uh, if I want literacy in sixth grade and above, fifth and sixth grade and above, uh, I have to have lots of active participation. And one of the possibilities is in every class I work with in middle schools and high schools, the teacher uses partners and structured partners, giving partners one and two. So I can say one to tell your partner, two to tell your partner. Uh, so we are going to start with uh, what we should see in all uh, classes. And you have this handout. Uh, and uh, if you don't have one, okay, does everybody have this one that you were given at the door? Ooh, okay. And so one side starts with every day in every class. So get that side up. And everybody reading the first line with me and go. Every day in every class, students will read, write, and speak. So when I work in intermediate grades, middle school, and high school, older students, 
Uh, this is the motto that we start with. And even if you just did this every single day, ensure that in every class, every day, in every period, students will read, they'll write, they'll speak. Every day in every class, they'll read, they'll write, they'll speak. Would we improve literacy at your school site, yes or no? Yes. It is a totally borrowable uh, model. Uh, every day in every class, we read, we write, we speak. Uh, so starting right there. Uh, and then what would we want uh, people to do? Well, my findings uh, as I read the research is that we could really make this an action plan in terms of what we might do uh, before uh, the students read in the classroom. Uh, that would also re require uh, reading and thinking, what we would do during writing, that would reading that would make a difference, and afterwards that would make a difference. So that's the way I've organized both the slides and then the summary that goes with the slides. Um, so, and I took an example uh, because uh, I was asked actually when I was in Australia to teach eighth graders, they had a social studies unit on trade and I was to teach about the Panama Canal and its relationship to trade. Ooh, it was a thriller. Uh, <laughs> but would it be useful for you as a citizen to know about the Panama Canal, yes or no? Yes, it would be useful to know. And is it possible that some kids in Ohio have missed it? Yes. Uh, so I uh, decided to not speak generally to you, but to use examples. Because if you want your teachers uh, to be able to articulate and utilize strategies, they need to see how they might work. Uh, so get ready, because we are going to have a perky pace, slightly frenetic. OK. Uh, <laughs> So what do we know about what we might do before, during, and after, but organizing this around before the students read for knowledge, before they listen uh, to a lecture, uh, before they view something like a video, basically the instruction would be the same whether it was reading, listening, or viewing. There are certain things we do before, certain things we do during, and afterwards that would make a significant difference. Uh, and he, uh, but once again, we start with the big idea. In every class, the students will read, they'll write, they will speak. Every class and every day and every period, they will, what everyone? Read, write, and speak. Now, okay, we negotiated some differences with PE. Uh, we negotiated differences with band and choir uh, that they could do part of it. Certainly, you speak in choir and you could read music and you could read lyrics, real good. Uh, but PE, uh, okay, we let a few people off. Okay, uh, so what might we do before? Well, if you look at uh, your handout, uh, you'll see a little preview of what makes a difference. Um, and that is, you're going to read something or you're going to be involved in watching a video. Uh, and uh, I need to present to you some, what everyone, some vocabulary. Uh, and I also need to ensure that you have, since it is the best predictor of comprehension, adequate, what everyone? Background, Background knowledge. Uh, and we know that particularly in informational text, if you go over it beforehand, if you look at it, uh, you preview it, you increase uh, the comprehension. Uh, and uh, also useful to have a, what everyone, a, a purpose. Uh, and so uh, these are what I would expect to see in a science class, a social studies class, a health class, a language arts class, uh, a reading uh, class that is at the uh, fifth or sixth grade level. So uh, one of the things that I disagree with some consultants is uh, we're getting the idea that many people are saying, well, you know, these are middle school and high school kids. You know, uh, they, no one front loads anything for us as adults. Uh, we don't get any vocabulary or background knowledge. We should just have the children uh, suffer through it. <laughs> Uh, just suffer through it, just uh, uh, suffer through it. Well, I have to tell you, there's a big difference between someone who's 72 years old and someone who is 10. 
Uh, we have a little more vocabulary. We have background knowledge. We have uh, many more of the things that are necessary for comprehension. So I have to tell you, all of those people who say, do cold reads only, do cold reads only, it's just like the state text, a cold reading, and life is a cold reading. Well, life should not be so cold. Uh, we should like heat it up uh, and give the children like hope. Uh, so uh, the research would say vocabulary and background knowledge are the two greatest uh, predictors of comprehension in any area. Uh, so I want you to have vocabulary and background knowledge so there is comprehension hope. So vocabulary, uh, we know it makes a difference. Vocabulary is directly related to reading what everyone? Comprehension, reading what everyone? Comprehension. Uh, in fact, um, uh, in a review of vocabulary uh, research, uh, Freddie Hebert, who's sort of the uh, major, uh, one of the major researchers in vocabulary wrote, I'm gonna read and then stop and you're gonna say the next word. Are you able to see this screen over here? You can't. Okay, that is like a little problem. Um, can you move over? Okay. And I need someone who can help me move this back because that's, that's a barrier. I don't know if we can though. I think it's taped down. Uh, that does not. It down. Well, Do you care if we peel the paper? Oh, heavens no. <laughs> Better? And I will watch where I stand too. I'll stand forward. Now can you see a little bit of it? Okay, we're deep into having people see. All right. So uh, I'm going to read when I stop, say the next word. Indeed, one of the most enduring findings, findings in reading Research. is the extent to which students' vocabulary knowledge relates to their reading comprehension. I mean, how many studies do we need on it? Uh, as all the way through adult life, your vocabulary directly uh, predicts how well you're going to comprehend. Uh, and so uh, we also know that in Marzano's review of research mm -hmm. that direct vocabulary instruction uh, has an impressive track, what everyone? Record of improving students' background Knowledge. and Comprehension. of academic content. Uh, so why would we want to not do it? Uh, the late Steve Saul had the largest study, and look at the relationship here. Uh, the effect size is 0.97. See, this is a two martini celebration <laughs> for any researcher. Uh, I mean, it made that much difference. So why would we not give that gift to our students? Uh, you know, I just recently listened to a keynote where uh, the person talked about uh, letting our kids struggle so they would get down into the pit, and then we had to help them out of the pit. Uh, and I said to him afterwards, no, our job is to keep them from getting in the pit uh, so that they have positive experiences because we know that mindset is going to make more difference than just struggling. Okay, well, anyway, I would teach it. Uh, so... Uh, but let's just look at how much vocabulary your children should emerge with. Uh, so it's estimated that to go to uh, college, university, you need at least 80,000 words. And raise your hand if you have some kids who aren't necessarily on the 80,000 word path. Uh, so uh, it would be useful if we use our best instruction to teach words. Now, if the word is well defined in the material, uh, and then we would give it less time. Or if it's a word that uh, is not critical to comprehension, we could give it less time. Uh, so we could make very good decisions about what words we taught. Now, uh, we do know this though. If I want words to become a part of your vocabulary, you need not one exposure, but what everyone? Whoa. Multiple exposures. The number of exposures uh, predicts your acquisition. For example, uh, in her research, Isabel Beck and Margaret McCohen found an average of 12 exposures was necessary for it to become a part of your personal lexicon. So you read it and you get the word in context, you get one exposure. Uh, but in teaching, we could up the number of exposures so it had a higher probability of being uh, the student's uh, own lexicon. And they need, yes, a definition, but also contextual information that gives examples 
and they need active participation. So we still have uh, non, uh, we have traditional vocabulary instruction at the secondary level. Maybe not in Ohio, but other states in the Midwest it does happen, uh, where the teacher says, on the board are 20 words. Uh, they are necessary for our next chapter. Uh, please copy the words, look them up in the glossary, write a sentence for each in your log. <laughs> See, this would not be like active participation. <laughs> So uh, this is a routine uh, that uh, we utilized in our book on explicit instruction that also used to, uh, tomorrow when I do vocabulary. That we'd first introduce the words, what everyone? Pronunciation. Pronunciation. This happens to be much more important than we thought in the past because a study done by Lene Airy uh, in high schools found that the teacher taught words but the students didn't always retain them. And then uh, they tried to figure out, well, why didn't they remember them? And it appears if you cannot pronounce the word and are not confident of the pronunciation, you cannot attach meaning to it and store it and retrieve the meaning. Uh, and so we have to be careful. Like if I'm a chemistry teacher, I bet some of us were never taught the pronunciation of those elements on the periodic chart. Uh, we only remember oxygen because we need it. Uh, so. Uh, and then we would introduce the words, what everyone, the words, meaning. meaning. We would illustrate it with some ick Example. examples. And then we'd ask questions to check their understanding. Uh, I could use this in sixth grade. I could use it uh, as with seniors. Uh, I could use it. So for example, uh, I was teaching the word complication because uh, the whole story about the building of uh, the uh, Panama Canal was based on the complications that occurred. Uh, and so you are my students. Uh, so uh, this word is complication. What word? Complication. complication. Put your hand on your table. Uh, we're going to tap out uh, the oral syllables in the word. Everyone, go slowly. Complication. Again, complication. And the whole word? Complication, complication, teacher talk. So after they determined that many kids didn't remember the words because they were unsure about the pronunciation, uh, they simply had the students orally segment the word. Now, just think what that would have uh, done in your high school experience. Uh, you would have been much more likely to remember the word, to be able to spell the word, and to attach meaning to it and store it in phonological memory. Uh, and uh, so, uh, this is the meaning of it, uh, and read it with me and go. A complication is something that makes a situation harder to deal with or more difficult to do. So when something makes it harder to do, harder for us to get done, we would say it is a what, everyone, a complication. Uh, and then we might have some examples. We're going to be studying about uh, the building and construction of the Panama, what, everyone? Canal, uh, and we're going to particularly focus on the complications that occurred uh, over the time it was built. It was built from 1881 to what, everyone? 1914, where we didn't have uh, massive uh, construction equipment that we have today. It was done mostly by hand uh, and uh, by fundamental kinds of technology. So here were some of the complications, though. Uh, one was what, everyone? Hot temperatures and jungle environment and mosquitoes and disease and deaths. Those are complications. <laughs> and there were also some engineering challenges, eh? uh, and many more. Uh, so, but you know, we have complications in our own life. Uh, you are preparing to study, and you, what, everyone? You left your book at school. That is a complication. Uh, you're going to wash the family's clothes. Oh, good for you. Uh, the complication. The washing machine is broken. That is a complication. Uh, so uh, let's uh, think about this. You are hoping uh, to run a marathon. One complication is. Think about it. First ones, then twos. Answer the question. Use a sentence starter. One complication is. Go. Eighth 
fall silent. Stand and deliver, use a sentence starter. And fall silent, listening. One complication is I can't run a mile. So 26, OK, uh, excellent. And stand and deliver. One complication is I've never ran a multiple. Uh, and my complication is, really, look at me. <laughs> OK, teacher talk for a moment. One of the things I'm doing at your grade levels uh, is stand and deliver. Uh, after the students have uh, had a chance to say an answer to their partner uh, and gotten feedback from their partner, then I will randomly call on students and have them stand and deliver. Why? It is immediate, raises the rigor of your classroom, immediately. But we actually took data to see if the students were more attentive to their peers when they stood and delivered versus sat and gave an answer. Uh, and it was significant. We simply did a very little cool little study uh, of uh, you stand and delivered everybody. Then later I have them write down what that person said. Or in another class they sit and call on someone, write down what they said, and there was like no comparison. So stand and deliver also gets them so that they could do one of your standards, and that would be present uh, to a group orally. All right, so we taught uh, the word complication. Uh, but this is the one that I uh, am really concerned about. Let's just take a little survey here. Raise your hand if you think it's possible that some of your eighth graders might not know in your district uh, where Panama is. Raise your hand if you think that. Okay. <laughs> Raise your hand if you think they might not know what locks are. Okay. Uh, and uh, raise your hand if they might not even know about uh, trade uh, through the Panama Canal. All right. So, and yet people tell me, but we shouldn't uh, do, give them any background knowledge. We should just have them like suffer. See, I think that that is not our job. I've never seen uh, that written in any of our contracts. Improve suffering, uh, but improve knowledge. One of the things that is really happening across our country is the idea that uh, in our world of technology that we shouldn't teach any knowledge, uh, but rather uh, we should, you know, have the kids just like Google it. This is really inconsistent with research on uh, problem solving. Uh, your brain needs a lot of knowledge, a lot of world knowledge. It needs a lot of specific knowledge for what problem you're solving. Uh, and so background knowledge, we just need to like stuff children's heads with background knowledge uh, in middle school and high school. Just stuff them with knowledge. Uh, and not only that, children like learning knowledge. Uh, so here is what we know about background knowledge. And that is uh, teacher talk. So I'm trying to model everything I do if I was teaching a high school class or a middle school class. And one thing is I'm not reading the slides to you. If you want the kids to get better in reading, they have to read and read and read some more and read and read and read some more. Tim Shanahan, who's right at this conference, uh, did a, an investigation in Chicago about secondary teachers when he became head of literacy for Chicago schools and uh, sent out data collectors and found that the teacher was reading the slides, the teacher was reading the directions, the teaching was reading the experiment, the teaching was reading the introduction the chapter, the teacher was reading the chapter. And you know, the teacher's getting like really good. <laughs> <laughs> but that is definitely not in our contract to improve our reading skills for the year. Uh, so I use every opportunity uh, I might Orally have them read, or I might use closed reading, which I just did. I read, stop, and you say the next word. We actually did a study on closed reading with middle school students compared to uh, having one child be called on to read in front of the class, very bad practice. Uh, having them silent read, but we have so many children that are silent reader fakers. Uh, and uh, oral reading and closed reading, and the best on task behavior was with closed reading. So I'm going to read when I stop, say the next word. Background Knowledge. of text has a major Impact. on whether or not a reader can comprehend Impact. text. This is across ages, across grades, across reading abilities, that the background knowledge makes a huge difference. Um, and 
as Willingham uh, says uh, and at this conference, and go. The more students know, the broader range of texts they can comprehend. Well, if you were to come to my city of Portland, Oregon, and say, Anita, what should I do in Portland? I would say, well, uh, Portland actually is a city very much like Columbus, uh, but I would say go to Powell's bookstore because we have the largest bookstore in the United States. It's three blocks long. You get a map. Uh, now, when I go to it, it's, it's also uh, a kind of unique because if you were like looking for like a new love interest, you don't go to a bar in Portland. No, you go to Powell's. Uh, and then you go, let's say you like to hike, and you go hang out in the hiking department. Uh, and so they're open till 2 o'clock on Friday night and Saturday <laughs> night. It is like, I mean, it is like the place. Not that I'm doing it. Uh, I just observe it. Uh, but I go to the Rose Room. Uh, children's literature, education, philosophy, uh, poetry, comparative religion, everything I'm interested in is right there uh, in that room. But I always envision that downstairs there is a gray room that I uh, am sure is labeled engineering. Uh, and now, when I go to the Rose Room, I can pick out anything because uh, I have the what, everyone, the background knowledge. And thus, my comprehension is very good. But if I went to the gray room, uh, there uh, I have absolutely no background knowledge in engineering. Uh, and so I would not be able to understand it without some front-loading instruction. And our kids are like that. Uh, we lift. So uh, you're my students. Uh, and so this is from a lesson I presented to them on the Panama Canal. And so you have to be a total participant here. Uh, and so the title is what, everyone? A highway of Water. Uh, and uh, so highway, of course, uh, is where, if it was a road, uh, it would be where cars uh, and trucks go. Uh, and a highway of water uh, is where they would have water, but have ships and boats go on it for transportation. But really, this would have been a better title, uh, what, everyone? Panama yeah. Canal. Uh, so we're going to learn about the Panama Canal, but first, uh, let's find out where it is. So this is the country of what, everyone? Yeah. Panama. And this line is representing the Panama Canal. Uh, and uh, here we have Venezuela, <coughs> Colombia, Ecuador, uh, and thinking for a moment, uh, and ones tell your partner what continent this is. Ones tell your partner what continent this is. Go. Okay. <laughs> Eyes up here. Okay. Is it possible that eighth graders need review of this? Okay, yes. it is the continent of what, everyone? Yes. South America. So actually, Panama at one time was part of Colombia. Uh, and so in the late 1800s, they, when the Panama Canal was first attempted to be built, they became a separate country. Uh, and here we have <coughs> countries that are called Central America. So this area is what, everyone? Central America. Uh, OK, so here uh, we have uh, a canal, the Panama Canal. Uh, and read the definition with me and go. A canal is a human-made waterway that provides passage between two natural bodies of water. Uh, and so let's just analyze that definition. Uh, so it is, first of all, a what, everyone? A Waterway. It is not a road, but a waterway. Uh, and it is human-made. Human -made. Uh, so it is not a natural river. Uh, it has been dug out, uh, though part of the Panama Canal is actually uh, a lake. Uh, and uh, it provides passage between, what? Two natural bodies of water. Uh, and so on uh, one side, we have the Atlantic Ocean, and the other, the Pacific Ocean. Uh, so, reading this edited one with Panama Canal added, I'll read when I start to say the next word. The Panama Canal is a human-made waterway uh, that provides passage between two natural bodies of water, the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. Excellent. Oh, so there it is. 
Uh, it's 52 miles long, so it's a narrow uh, edge. And we see here uh, a map of the Panama Canal. And see this lake here, Bottom Lake, uh, was also made a <coughs> lake so that they wouldn't have to dig out the whole canal. Uh, so by flooding the area, making it a, a lake uh, that ships could sail on, they only had to dig out this part and that part. Uh, so uh, Gotten uh, Lake, and I had to check with the spell out the pronunciation of it, Gotten Lake, uh, read it with me. Gotten Lake is an artificial lake that formed a major part of the Panama Canal. Uh, but here's the problem. It is what? 85 feet above sea level. So here's sea level is 85 feet above. So one of the big problems is if a ship comes from sea level, how are they going to get to 85 feet? Well, what they're going to use are locks. What are they called, everyone? Locks. Now, you know locks like a door, uh, but this is talking about an engineering miracle that was made to go from sea level 85 feet up. Uh, so it is a, what everyone, uh, a device. Uh, and you can see it right here. Uh, so there are some uh, big uh, gates that open and close that lock the ship in. Uh, and it is, everyone, used for raising and lowering boats and ships. Uh, so the locks close, the water flows in, and the ship goes up, and then the gates open, and the ship goes to the next lock. Uh, and so it is used for raising and lowering ships uh, between, everyone, different water levels on river and canal waterways. Uh, here is even a better picture of it, and it shows the size of it, too. Look at the truck. And then I just want you to think, as you look at this, that this was built and finished in 1914 when we didn't have all of the tools uh, for construction now. I mean, it's for no a good reason called the seventh uh, wonder of uh, the modern world. Okay. Well, so the ship comes in here, the water rises. When it gets to this level, the gates open, the ship goes in the next, the go gates close. They go in here, and when the water comes up, then they go up to the next and the next until they can sail out. Uh, so today, uh, just for your own interest, about uh, four years ago, they widened it uh, to accommodate large cruise ships uh, that were too wide for the Panama Canal. Uh, so many of the ships that go through are cruise ships, like people on vacation. Uh, who want to go from like New York City uh, back up to, uh, let's say, San Francisco, they go through the Panama Canal. Uh, and, but then there's also, more importantly, cargo ships uh, that allow trade uh, between countries. Because if we didn't have the Panama Canal and they left, left New York, they'd have to go all the way down to the bottom of South America and come back up. Whoa. We need the what, everyone? The Panama Canal. And so uh, if we had things coming to New York City, let's say from China, they would go through here. Or if we sent things to China for a balance of trade, we hope, uh, then they would go through here. Well, uh, so just look at how uh, narrow this is. So it's so narrow that they have a special crew. So when the boat pulls in up here, uh, the crew that is on it, the captain, all the crew, are asked to go to another room, and a new crew comes on uh, who will guide them through the Panama Canal. Uh, so just a little map here shows you why we might use this. So uh, you're in the middle of the country, but if something, uh, if we wanted to go from the East Coast, let's over to Asia, uh, then we go through the what, everyone? The Panama Canal. If we want to go to the West Coast and go over to Europe, we have to go through the Panama Canal. So just a few fun facts. Uh, so uh, look at the increase of vehicles, and this is expected uh, to double. I couldn't get the data for 2019, but expected to double now that they've opened it up for those cruise ships. It takes eight to 10 hours. 
uh, and the average toll, the average cost is $150,000 to go through it. But the big cruise ships are going to be paying $1 million uh, to go through the Panama Canal because it costs them a lot more to sail all the way down and around South America. Okay. Well, so we've learned some things about the Panama Canal. Uh, and uh, I want you just to look at the slides to review it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Stand up, stand up, face your partner, face your partner. Okay, listening. You've learned some things about the Panama Canal, a little retrieval practice. Uh, once you're going to start, you're going to say, here's some things you need to know about the Panama Canal. Say it, everyone. Here's some things you need to know about the Panama Canal. And once you're going to tell everything you can remember, and then when I say uh, shift, actually, I... I used the word shift the day I taught it, and they all thought I said. <laughs> so I'll try another word next. OK. One, tell your partner, but start out with, here's the things you need to know about the Panama Canal, and go. Program. Sorry, what? You have your program. I just need to double check the time because they might have changed it. Uh... Okay. Thanks. Next. Add to it. Sit, 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 sit. So, if we now read an article, which is online for you, uh, is it possible that uh, you would have better comprehension of the article, which is the history of the building of the Panama Canal? with that little background knowledge, yes or no? Yes. But there's another possibility. Raise your hand if you're like more curious, like you want to like Google it. Uh, you want to double check on the million dollars. See, but for us not to do this means that I would lower your comprehension. Why would I not want to take some time to teach you some background knowledge? But also, importantly to note that knowledge is the kernel, the seed of all curiosity. All curiosity comes from some knowledge. Until you have some knowledge, you're not like curious. Watch your Google behavior. You don't just wake up in the morning and say, woo, it's DNA day. Uh, <laughs> instead, you read something, and then you say, oh, I want to follow up on that. True? I mean, watch your uh, dinner mates. And when you Google things, it's, oh, oh, let me check that. You know, I had to check, okay, can I admit this? Don't tell. I had to check to see if Ohio State actually was in Columbus. <laughs> I mean, to verify that, because uh, then I went to FedEx, which uh, happened to be the one that was open yesterday to get these run off, and, and I said to the driver, what's that? And he said, ooh, Ohio State. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Thank God I had that information. So, but I Googled it then and learned about it. Uh, so, but uh, I think our kids deserve the knowledge uh, that allows them to be uh, of this world and the knowledge that allows them access to what they're reading and the knowledge that would create curiosity for them. All three of those are so critical for our students. Now, is there other ways to do it? Because this one took a little bit of preparation. Not a lot. Uh, it didn't take a lot of preparation, probably less than 20 minutes. But uh, if I wanted... Uh, to uh, d do that. Well, I could tell teachers if they have devices, uh, you could do this, listening, 
So we're going to read about the Panama Canal. You have your paper out for brainstorming, uh, and uh, you are going to, uh, in a moment, you'll have four minutes to do this, uh, to go online, and you're going to write notes about what you've learned about Panama Canal. Uh, what are you going to look for, everyone? Panama Canal, I've posted the word there, uh, and uh, go. And then when they were done, uh, I said, uh, what's your first fact? Raise your hand if you have the same fact. If you do, then circle it. If you don't, uh, add it. What's your fact? Raise your hand if you have that. Oh, uh, you're the only one who has it, which we didn't validate it. We didn't verify it. Cross it out on yours. And what was your fact? Uh, and so that uh, we had a validation experience. So you could use one like that uh, and a combination. You're not prepared, so then you do it with them. Uh, you're totally prepared. You've done it in advance. Either will work well. But end it with what I just did, which is retrieval practice. That's what we have to add to secondary classes is time where you actually have to retrieve the information. Well, uh, okay, we could also preview, and previewing is most important with informational text. Because when we look it over before we read, we learn about the topics that will be, what, everyone? Covered. Uh, we learn about what will be emphasized. We learn about how it's going to be organized. Uh, and it will also activate any background knowledge that you already have. Uh, so. Uh, you don't have the article in front of you, but the day I taught it, uh, I said to the students, uh, find uh, the heading. So this is about uh, Panama Canal. Find uh, the first um, uh, heading and read it, everyone, the solution. So we might be able to infer if there's a solution that first before it was like a problem and that they would have to come up with a, what, everyone, a solution. And you've already seen the picture of the Panama Canal as it was concluded, as it was constructed. Uh, and first ones and twos tell your partner uh, what might have been a problem uh, that led to the solution, which was building the Panama Canal. Whisper to your partner and go. Okay, eyes up here. So I heard one problem might be uh, trade. A number of you said uh, it would be getting from the east coast of the United States to the west coast. That might have been the problem that, was, uh, that led to it. Uh, and uh, the next uh, heading, and read it. The first attempt to build the Panama Canal. We could infer from that. Uh, was there one attempt or was there more than one attempt? More than one, okay. Uh, and uh, read the next one. The, the United, United States, States decides, decides to finish, finish the canal. Out. So were we the first attempt? So we're going to learn that France actually was the first attempt. Uh, and uh, then read it. Using, using the, the Panama, Panama canal. canal. Most of it, this whole course that we're in right now is focused on what? Trade. What is it focused on? Trade. So we're going to learn that one of the major uses is trade. Um, and I established the learning intention with the students that afterwards they could explain about the Panama Canal, uh, what was the uh, attempts to build it, and what complications and how is it used today. And that they would be given three paragraphs over the next two days that they were going to complete where I gave them the topic sentence and they were going to complete it. Okay, just think about this class. Uh, have um, we read anything, yes or no? Yes. I mean, OK. In this example lesson, have you had to read at all, yes or no? Yes. yes. OK, so you read what was on the slides. Um, OK. Uh, have you had uh, to uh, speak at all? Yes. You've had to say answers to your partner. You've had to defend your answers. Uh, and you're going to be writing when we complete this. So uh, it's around those big ideas that in every class, you'll read, you'll write, you'll speak. Uh, I want to just tell you that I could have just given you the big ideas, but uh, I find that secondary people do much better if they can see this in action with an example. Uh, that then, then they say, well, oh, I could do that in my health class. I could do that in my science class. I could do that in my social studies class. But just giving general, like, uh, just giving them this uh, won't lead to the changes you need. You're going to have to demonstrate what you want. 
Well, during. What should we do during? Well, here is a challenge. If I just said to high school juniors or eighth graders, okay, read the article about Panama. Could you have some, literally, some silent reader fakers? Yes, yes or no? Yes. Okay, here's the best faker I've ever met. Eighth grade faker. I told him to read a section silently. I'm monitoring, and this one young man is talking to his friend, and here's the book, and he's dragging his finger across the book. <laughs> and I said to him, do you think I believe that you uh, are reading uh, a finger reader? I said, if it was Braille, that's one thing. It's not Braille. Uh, I said, at least you have to look at the words. Uh, so we might want to do some others to get them to actually focus their attention and their concentration on what they're reading. Uh, and we know that executive function, which is attention and which is concentration, is needed for comprehending oral and written language. So uh, here are some of the things that we could do. And this is just like a little preview. Uh, I could ask them questions as they read. Uh, the students could generate questions. And then they could also employ strategies. And of course, there's many more strategies than we could touch upon, but just to give you some ideas. Uh, and uh, so one of the possibilities is I could have the students read a certain section, and I could ask them a question to get them to hone in on the critical information, to focus on the critical information, to concentrate on the information. And recently, a person said, but Anita, asking questions is like so old school. <laughs> you know, I'm here to tell you there's some old things that are good, uh, and including, uh, including asking questions. Uh, Margaret McEwen uh, and Isabel Beck did a very well-conceived study to show that asking questions improved comprehension of what they were reading, but also, if done over time, improved their future uh, comprehension. Uh, and uh, I know that in Ohio, you've been talking about text-dependent questions. Uh, so uh, ones, tell your partner uh, what text-dependent questions are and go. What, dear? I know, I get it. No. Do you ever use a PowerPoint? Okay, if you touch B, it makes it go black, or W, it makes it go white. <laughs> okay, looking up here. So, uh, text dependent questions. One answer I heard was well, when you have text dependent questions, the answers are dependent on the text. That actually is not a bad uh, answer, and it was totally from the context closed, woo woo. Uh, <laughs> but that is exactly what they are. We've read something, a section or paragraphs, uh, and now I'm asking you questions uh, that are on the text, on the evidence in the text. Uh, and why do we do this? Because this is kind of a major shift from like 10 years ago when we say, when you ask questions, there should be three kinds. You should connect uh, the students to the text, but you should also connect the text to what's happening in the world, but also connect the text to their personal experiences. Okay, don't write those three down. Uh, we bang them into your head, uh, text uh, to experience, text to world, and you to the text until research was done to show, whoa, not a good idea, particularly trying to connect it to personal experience. Because what happens when you connect it to personal experience is children's cognition, that concentration that's needed, totally leaves the text. May I give you an example? Now, this is my best one I've ever seen. Uh, it was in New Jersey, the Garden State. I've yet to see the garden there, but uh, it is the Garden State. Uh, and so uh, the teacher is reading with the students uh, in sixth grade a 
story that is in their anthology, an adventure story about a family who has gone to Idaho uh, to do rapid river kayaking. Okay? So they're reading the initial uh, part of the introduction. And after they've read that, the teacher stops and says, have any of you had a similar experience? And at that moment, everything went downhill. Uh, so first child raises his hand. He says, yes, we live outside of the city. We live on the lake, and we have kayaks. Next child says, uh, I just live two houses down from him, and we also live on the lake, and we have kayaks. But he has double kayaks. We chose as a family single kayaks, so we could ride side by side. Next child raises her hand and says, I also live at the lake, uh, but and it's a non-motorized lake. Uh, and so we decided that we would get canoes rather than kayaks. The reason we got canoes is we have lots of visitors, and they can sit in the middle of the canoe. Uh, and uh, But in the kayak, you can't have visitors because they're going to have to paddle, particularly in a single. They won't know how to paddle. And the next child raises her hand and says, well, we live at the shore. Uh, and, but we do have kayaks, but they are much longer than the ones in the picture that they used for rapid kayaking on the rivers. And the next child raises her hand and says, and you've never been in a kayak or a canoe, but last summer our grandparents took our entire family uh, to New York City, and we had a boat tour going up the Hudson <laughs> River where they pointed out the architecture and the skyline. Uh, and then as if to like wrap it up, the last child raises her hand and said, I've never been on a boat, but in our living room we have an oil painting of a sailboat. <laughs> okay, now is it possible that your thoughts have lost the text? Yes. Yes or no? Yes. And so uh, that is where we question what we had told you. You want to ask those kind of connecting questions, do it before they read or after they read, but not during reading. And you all have had this experience. You have sat down to read something, uh, and your thoughts are definitely not with it. Uh, you're thinking about uh, school. You're thinking about your job. You're thinking about your partner. You're thinking about who's going to walk the dog. Well, he's not going to, or she's not going to. And so then the next night, you come back, and you pick up the book, and you have no recall at all of what was covered in the 20 pages you read last night. Right? Raise your hand if you've had that experience. Proves the point. Uh, so. Uh, we ask text-dependent questions. Uh, and basically, this is why. We want to keep all of the students' cognitive energy in the text. We want to keep all of their thoughts in the text uh, so that they're in the text, not out of the text. They're in the text, not out of the text. Yes, you're going to do it with me. You knew it. Uh, and you think I don't see you, but I can. Uh, in the text, not out of the text. Everybody. In the text, not out of the text. In the text, not out of the text. Until I see everyone with the actions, I'm not moving ahead. In the text, not out of the text. In the text, not out of the text. Good. Teacher talk. That is the kind of persistence a secondary teacher needs. They just have to act like we're doing it. Be non-apologetic. Do not get angry, but just say we're doing it and keep asking until you get it. Because if you choose not to do it, then at the beginning of the school year, three kids choose not to. Then eight kids choose not to. Then 19 choose not to. And then you have, oh, gifted one, the only one responding. <laughs> <laughs> and so, all right. So in the paragraph uh, or in the uh, electronic materials available to you, you could uh, read the, par the article. Uh, but after they read it, uh, I put up this slide uh, where we have a question uh, before the Panama Canal was built. How did people travel from the East Coast to the West Coast of the United States? Background knowledge, again, for what they're going to read more on. And then I gave them a thinking time, uh, and I had them share the answer with their partner, and then we shared it with the class. But I gave them uh, a sentence starter to increase the quality of their answer. So this was paragraph two, text-dependent question. Paragraph three, text-dependent question. Um, okay, but then the research, we also learn that having students generate questions at the secondary level uh, is actually going to be as strong as or stronger than the teacher asking questions. 
Uh, so this is something we can incorporate in all of our classes where they read a certain amount uh, and they uh, stop and they generate uh, one or two questions and write them down and then they record the answers uh, and uh, then they could share them also with their partner and with the class. So uh, on paragraph five in the demonstration I did in Australia, that's what we did. We stopped uh, and we asked uh, why was he selected to build the canal? Well, he uh, led the canal because he was also the builder of the Suez Canal. Uh, and that was one child answer, question and answer. What were the complications of the French abandoning the project? This is a child's question, and then there notes the answer. Uh, and so to me, teaching kids how to ask and record really good questions with really good answers uh, would make a big difference. Now, here is the challenge we had with this, though. Uh, some of them wrote down uh, really tacky little questions, like, where's Panama Canal in Panama? <laughs> So what we did is sim very simple. Uh, you're team A, you're team B. I call on you, pick your first question, and read it. And follow over here, someone to answer it. If they answer it correctly, they get a point. Uh, if uh, they don't, you get a point, and you get to call on someone on your team to ask the next question. And then they call on this. Well, is it possible that we got higher level questions, <laughs> right? And it worked really well because not only that, we have retrieval practice built into that game. Uh, we have review of the information, simple like that. But we had to do something to get higher order questions. Uh, then we had success criteria for the questions and also for the answers. OK, uh, another uh, strategy that has been uh, research validated uh, is uh, getting the gist. Uh, and this originally came out of the research of Fuchs and Fuchs at Vanderbilt and then was researched by Sarah Vaughn uh, at University of Texas, Austin uh, with middle school students in a project called Collaborative uh, Re uh, Comprehension. And uh, this is one that could be teacher directed or it could be, once they learned it, it could be partner directed. Uh, so the strategy is, uh, you read a paragraph, informational text, read a paragraph, and you what, everyone? Name the who or what the paragraph is about in a brief phrase. So you have to read it and then come up with a phrase. Uh, and then identify two or three important details about the topic. And then you have to, uh, everyone, shrink the paragraph by stating or writing the main idea. Uh, and it has to be in 10 to 15 words. Uh, so. Um, so when we did this, we uh, first I did a what everyone and I do it, I'm modeling it. And so uh, we read the paragraph together uh, and then I had them read step one and then I modeled it. Uh, so I asked myself, what is the most important thing I want to remember about this? Uh, I do want to remember that uh, it was France uh, who, uh, uh, initially started building it uh, and that there was an experienced canal builder. I know I won't remember the name forever, but I will remember uh, that he built the Suez Canal. Uh, and so uh, read it with me and go. In 1879, France built the Panama Canal led by an experienced canal builder. Uh, and so I modeled it and then we did it together. We read the paragraph, uh, we stopped. Uh, and uh, I said, think uh, who or what this paragraph is about, tell your partner. Uh, and then I called on a student or students to tell me that, what had them underline important details they wanted to include. I will tell you though, one of the things I'm finding in this area where we're really focusing on annotation, including underlining, I, I'm finding that children are underlining everything. <laughs> Uh, and I'm doing it like a rainbow. Uh, one day I was in an eighth grade class and I was, it was in uh, Kalamazoo in Michigan. Uh, and I got there early to do a demonstration lesson and this young boy came in probably about 15 minutes, we're still left in his lunch hour. 
And I said, well, you know, we don't start for 50 minutes to go sit outside, read a book, visit with your friends. And he said, no, I like to get an early start on highlighting. <laughs> OK. Anyway, so I now have children not use markers. I have just used pencil uh, because it allows them also to add notes in the margin. Uh, and so they don't have to change writing tools and teach them to only underline enough words to retrieve the information, uh, not the whole sentence, not the whole thing. So, uh, so then we had to identify and underline uh, two important things. Uh, and then they had to shrink it down. And this is one of the students and uh, complications including hot temperatures, diseases, and inadequate funds forced the French to stop the project. 14 words. Woo. <laughs> but if I was a social studies teacher and when we read chapters, uh, we uh, did this for the important part of chapters and we did it for the entire year, is it possible that the students would like learn more? Yes or no? Not only that, they would come up with these nice little summaries uh, of the article when they done, the chapter when they were done, that they could study. But this strategy, yes, could be teacher directed. Um, and as I did in this lesson, I directed them. But later, you two are partners. You could have these steps here. You read the paragraph, and he says, name the core of what, tell the most important thing, say it in 10 words or less, write it down. Uh, so it could be a partner, or it could be a team. Uh, but it is much more intentional, much more conscious uh, than often what we do in reading textbook material. We can also teach them how to take notes. The best research on note taking is Cornell Notes, two column notes, mm -hmm. where you write down, if you're reading a book, the topic and the details that relate to it for that paragraph, the next paragraph, topic and detail, topic and detail, and then before you leave the page, you stop and write a summary. This one thing that I would suggest that all middle school teachers or all middle schools and high schools do, and that is select one form of note taking for your school. Because now I see the science does it one way, the social studies teacher does it another way, the English teacher, and the kids don't become automatic at it. And they need to become automatic. And two column notes um, probably has the best possibility because you could take notes on what you hear, what you read, on the video. Topic, detail, topic, detail. Well, after reading, what might we do? Okay. So what we're trying to get at here is uh, a big picture and a specific picture. A big picture of the kind of activities we could do before as illustrated in our white page with beautiful <laughs> notes on it now. I'll put this up online, though with the other materials, because this is not online. Uh, put that online for you so you could use it as a planner. Uh, so we're looking for uh, these uh, to be uh, responded to by teachers uh, and also an example. So how about after reading? Well, there's two big things that emerge from the secondary reading re or research on what to do afterwards. One is discussion, and two is writing a summary. So let's look at discussion. Uh, here's the problem with discussions. Is it possible that a discussion uh, in, let's say, sixth grade social studies, that m maybe all the students might not participate? Is that possible? Yes, that would, in fact, that's a definite, OK? Uh, and uh, that would happen across the grade levels. In fact, raise your hand if you happen to be a middle school or high school teacher sitting in this room. OK, right here. And you teach? Yeah, and social studies. Yeah, OK, and social studies. So uh, name three kids, their first names, uh, who would always participate in a discussion. Grace, Riley, and Riley. Grace, Riley, and Riley. See, in one study, that's what they found. Every teacher could say, not Grace, Riley, and Riley, but could name very quickly three kids who always participated. And also could name three kids who never participated. So that is the problem that researchers try to look at to see what we could do with discussions. So a few pointers about discussions. Uh, first of all, it helps to have a well-designed question in mind for the actual discussion. Uh, and so the day that I had 
I worked on the Panama Canal for two days, and uh, this was our discussion. In the last sentence of the article, the author calls the Panama Canal a phenomenon. Uh, why is the Panama Canal a phenomenon? Uh, so you have a good question for it. But then, put a, well, you don't have it in front of you, but if you did, I'd say put a star by B because this made the big difference, is giving them a time to plan their talking points. Write down like your talking points of why it's a phenomenon. Write down your talking points. Just write down notes. Uh, it would uh, make it so much better. And then, uh, so those three kids that always participate, but many who don't, uh, so you say everybody first ones, then twos. Share your talking points with your partner uh, about why it is a phenomena and uh, how you would defend that answer. Uh, so even though maybe they don't volunteer for the actual discussion, they've already been a part of the discussion, so they shared it with their partner. And I would definitely add talking points and sharing with your partner. Uh, and then, how many kids do you have in your uh, middle school class? Well, just pick one. What's the highest number? 18. 18. Oh, my God. <laughs> Everyone's jealous. <laughs> Okay, raise your hand if you have more than 30. Okay, and so, see, weren't you jealous? Right away, I mean, you're going to ask what district, are there any openings? Uh, <laughs> but let's say I have 30 kids. Uh, and uh, the problem there is no one has a discussion with 30 kids. Uh, I mean, you don't go to dinner with 30 people and discuss with all of them. You go to, and have a smaller number. So we improve the discussions quite significantly by... Uh, breaking them into smaller discussion groups uh, where one person shares an answer, the others agree or disagree, but they also have to ask clarifying questions. But we can, discussions, I mean, the effect size is 0.84 uh, when it's done this well. So it's useful to do it for the purpose of learning. But um, these are from a study that found some of our children have heard lots of arguments but no discussions. And so they needed like civil uh, sentence starters for discussions. And instead of saying, that's stupid, maybe uh, you would say, uh, could you please clarify your idea for me? Uh, very civil. OK, but if I was to suggest one thing that we did uh, to improve comprehension and writing would be have students write a summary, 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 write a summary. Write a summary, write a summary, write a summary. Uh, Carnegie uh, funded two major researchers, research projects at your uh, grade levels to review research. And it was done by uh, Steve Graham and Dolores Perrin. And one was on writing. And one of the recommendations for writing was have them write a summary, write a summary, write a summary. Uh, then they did one on reading comprehension. And one of the recommendations is have them write a summary, write a summary, write a summary. So this is the two for one, being able to write a summary. And it could be as simple as having them write a sentence. Uh, so some of my favorite, uh, one of them comes out of a book I highly recommend that uh, you get. Um, and it was The Writing Revolution by Judith Hoffman. It's the best book I've ever seen written for middle school, high school in terms of writing. Uh, uh, and very explicit, very direct practices. Uh, and one of them uh, was having them uh, write a sentence where you put on the screen a starter sentence, like here I put a, a country started to build the Panama Canal but failed. And then they have to add notes, who was this, when was this, why was this, and then they have to put it all together. Uh, and um, so, this was one student's answer, France, 1879, uh, why all of these. But would you read the, this was in eighth grade, uh, and it was in Australia, but they don't differ from your kids. Read the expanded sentence with me and go. In 1879, France started to build the Panama Canal, but failed because of the hot, rainy weather, tropical diseases, and not enough money to finish the project. Woo. Ooh, okay. So this would be one, a short summary of what they've read. 
another one that kids love that I adore is from her book also, Because But So. Uh, and you give them a sentence starter. They read this, and the sentence starter was, the Panama Canal is an amazing phenomenon because uh, the Panama Canal is an amazing phenomenon. But the Panama Canal is an amazing phenomenon. So, and uh, then uh, this would emerge, and this is a student's answer. Um, the Panama Canal is an amazing phenomenon because it allows ships to quickly sail from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. It's also amazing because of the sophistication of the engineering, though it was built from uh, 19, then this is when the uh, U.S. had it, from 1904 to 1913. Uh, the Panama Canal is an amazing phenomenon, but its construction cost thousands of workers their lives, 5,000 U.S. and many, many more French. Uh, the Panama Canal is an amazing phenomenon, so it continues to be improved, transporting more and more ships from the Atlantic uh, to the Pacific for the purchase of trade and tourism. I highly recommend Because But So. We have one school district where at least three days a week the teacher is doing Because But So as the kids come into class as their warm-up activity. Uh, and so it's a perfect warm-up activity. Uh, it is high outcome, low prep. All you need is a sentence starter uh, and Because But So, and then discussion afterwards. Now they could uh, write uh, a uh, summary with a writing frame and I use this because not every teacher in middle school and high school is a teacher of writing. Uh, and so we need to give some scaffolding to the social <coughs> studies, the health teacher, the science teacher, et cetera. Uh, so here we have the first part of a sentence. Uh, and so the students copy it in this passage. A number of critical points were made about the building of the Panama Canal in the early 1900s. First, the authors pointed out that France was the first country to attempt to so that they use this. And they actually end up with a coherent paragraph. Raise your hand if you'd love like coherent <laughs> paragraph, maybe with transition words. So why did I uh, make this decision? Well, uh, that before they could, uh, this is a big review, they could uh, teach what, everyone? No. Vocabulary <laughs> and background knowledge, they could preview and they could establish a purpose. And uh, during uh, it, they could ask teacher-generated questions or even better, student-generated questions. Uh, and they could use different practices for reading it, including uh, getting the gist and taking two column notes. And after reading, they could have a discussion uh, or the students could write a summary. It might be a summary sentence or a summary paragraph. Now, if all of our teachers did that, would we have more literacy happening in our schools? Yes or no? Yeah. Uh, and But we can start out with in every class. You'll read, you'll write, you'll speak. Every class, you'll read, you'll write, you'll speak. Uh, and that is the first big idea. But we need some collaborative um, efficacy that all students can learn, but we're going to have to teach them to have them learn. Well, then the question might be, hmm, we still have a few struggling students. What do we need to do with them? But I'm telling you, the energy first must be put in tier one, in general ed, yeah. and every science and social studies class. Because if we did this, we would reduce the number of children that needed intervention. But I'll also tell you uh, that Ohio has been very dedicated uh, to increasing the quality of instruction in K-1, 2, and 3 uh, with pro major projects across the state uh, to teach decoding, all those critical content that I mentioned earlier today. And I can tell you what will happen is that you'll have more kids coming in to middle school and high school who can read. And would that not be like glory? Like you could teach a seventh grade social studies class and kids could actually like read the book. Right. Right? So a lot of this needs to happen beforehand. But would you just take yours and like turn it over? So I knew that I would have very little time left at the end. And intervention is actually uh, my um, 
area of research. Uh, but we do have students who uh, have not yet mastered the actual reading of the code. Uh, and um, so uh, we definitely uh, would need for those tier two, tier three students interventions on reading the code. Now I can tell you from my own research that the majority of children who are struggling readers uh, in the middle school and high school uh, read between third and fifth grade. They're not like total non-readers, but they don't read at the seventh, the eighth, the ninth, the tenth, eleventh, the twelfth grade. Uh, and so that means that their biggest problem in terms of intervention in the code uh, is being able to read multisyllabic words. Uh, and so we need intervention that would uh, introduce uh, them to strategies for reading multisyllabic words, which means that they have to know uh, all of the letter sound pronunciations for parts of the words, but they also need to know prefixes and suffixes. Uh, and this is seldom something we can teach in like a general chemistry class. They need intervention separate from it, a separate class, in order to teach them the code at the multisyllabic level. But they also read slowly, those struggling students. Uh, now, at the, if we look at the research, let's say, by uh, Jan Hasbrook and Jerry Tyndall, who have taken samples of children more recently uh, across uh, middle school years, um, the uh, benchmark would be that if you're a sixth grader, or seventh, or eighth, or ninth, that you could read 120 oral words per minute. That you could, excuse me, 150 oral words per minute. And it's pretty much the same across all of those grades. And mostly because your fluency is going to be based on your speed of speech. And so that is a speaking tone, and that is what we'd want. Uh, so how to get kids to be more fluent in intervention? Well, having them read a lot makes a big difference. Reading and reading and reading some more. Uh, so they could read short things chorally. Uh, they could read where we do closed reading. I read stop and you say the next word. They could read to their partner. Uh, or they could do repeated readings, which has some of the best intervention research. I read a passage for a minute. Uh, and then I reread it to see if I can read more in a minute. Then I see if I can read more in a minute. And I reread the same material, and I read more in a minute. So some type of uh, repeated reading. So I would say a lot of your students who are really struggling, it's the code aspect. They can't read the words, multisyllabic words, and they're not fluent. But then the next one would be, Every teacher's teaching vocabulary in their classes, but some students actually need more pre-teaching of vocabulary to do well. Uh, so we might, uh, we now have introduced like teaching for 10 minutes outside of class, the big vocabulary for their uh, social studies class or for their science class. Um, but also a lot of instruction uh, on the morphographs in words, uh, the prefixes, the suffixes, the roots. Uh, so, but turn back to the first page. This is what we need to get in place now for everybody to help reduce the number of kids that would need intervention. But there will be some, and working on your primary program. But in every class, every day, if students would only read and write and speak, if in every class, every day, they read, they write, they speak, and I would start with that uh, as something that, uh, that we could grasp. And then your teachers could add to uh, this outline of what we could do before, during, and after. OK, so just to be certain that you go online, these slides are online for you. And I asked them to put it up as a PowerPoint so you could use them. I'll double check on that. I'm not sure they did that, but yes, I'll did. they did? Yay. <laughs> OK, so but you also have uh, a copy of the uh, article. Maybe you want to reread it yourself. Uh, but the reason I did that is, see if I can get that to, on the last page of that handout, there is uh, like a lesson plan for it. 
so that you can see how this could be put into practice. Okay, uh, everybody, don't leave, but stand up and face your partner. Hold this in your hand. And listen, you come from different walks of life. Some of you are teachers. Uh, some of you are consultant to districts, uh, to schools. Some of you are administrators. Uh, and I want you to think how this content you might utilize back in your school site. Uh, so thinking, not sharing. So you're going to start by saying twos are going to go first, uh, and then when I say next, ones will do it. But you'll start by saying, as a social studies teacher, I would. Uh, as a principal at a school, I will. Uh, as a consultant, I intend to. Uh, so uh, give a little sentence starter first, having your role in it. Twos are starting. And begin. Hey, silence. Okay, our program says that uh, now it is lunch on your own. Yes. yes, it is. Go. Thank you for being here. Have a thank wonderful you. rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.